This week, we're going to talk about securing services with Linux. So our topics will be how to manage services. We've talked about that a little bit already, so we'll review that. And then we're going to talk about how to harden services, uh, how to use mandatory access controls like SE Linux and AppArmor. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about development tools, which is not so much of a concern as it used to be, but we'll talk about that. So what exactly is hardening? Hardening is the process of locking down a system to protect it and all the resources that are on that system. So that can include data, services, the system itself, right? Um, so when we install a, a system uh, to make it as hardened as possible, we're generally going to try to use minimal installation options. So if we can, we'll install no GUI. Now in this course, we haven't used the GUI at all, right? Everything's been in the command line. We haven't even installed the desktop environment. And it's generally a good idea not to. Um, provide fewer ways for an attacker to access the system. We're talking about reducing that attack surface. And there's this old saying with IT that, you know, a, a secure system, a system that's 100% secure is 100% off, right? Um, we can't always do that. So we want to turn off as much as we can to get it as secure as we can, right? So we'll disable as many services as we can. Anything that we don't need, we're going to remove from those services or from those servers, any components that aren't required, right? So that's really what we're doing in the process of hardening a system. So a hardened system, some topics around hardening. So there's package managers, right? And why is package management important? Why do we talk about that with hardening? Well, pretty much everything that you install on in a Linux system, you're probably going to do so with a package manager, right? Uh, one of the most oldest and most common is RPM, the Red Hat Package Manager. There's a slightly different one that you would use on a lot of Debian distributions. Um, the thing about RPM, so RPM doesn't really automatically install dependencies. It just kind of says, hey, you can't install this because these things are missing. And if you try to uninstall something, if you want to remove something, RPM knows how to kind of unwind everything, uh, you know, it, when it got installed, right? When it When it was placed on the system um, so traditionally RPM uh, you know is a great package manager it's been around for a long time um, but again there's some you know it doesn't do everything that you need so then you get things like yellow dog updater or the yellow dog updater modified which is yum um, in the Debian world it's apt-get right we use apt-get in Debian we use yum in Red Hat right so in this course we've been using RPM uh, yum with RPM right now, of course, you don't realize RPM is, is in the background, right? Um, you know, we, we might have set up some repositories for some of the labs, but, you know, we haven't really, you know, looked at RPM in too much detail on this course. And we might do that later on. I think we're going to do that next week a little bit when we talk about applications. But um, what the difference is with Yellow Dog, why do we need that? Well, that's going to download those package, you know, those RPM package files and run them. But it also can keep track of what all the dependencies are, right? So it knows how to go find all the dependencies and install those. Now, is that a good thing that it handles the dependencies for us? I mean, yeah, it probably is a good thing, except um, if you're forced to go and download all these dependencies and go and find all these dependencies, then you're intimately familiar with what all the dependencies are on a package, right? Um, you know, so you're, you're kind of aware of it. Now, how many times when you ran the yum command in this class, did you just run it, let it go and let it install a whole bunch of dependencies? You saw a whole bunch of things fly past the screen. You probably didn't even read it, right? Uh, you just let it do whatever it needs to do to get whatever you need on that system, right? And that's kind of the, the, the risk with things like yum, right? Is it's going to install a bunch of crap that we don't even know what it is. Uh, a good example of that is GNOME, right? GNOME is a desktop manager. Now, as I said, we haven't installed the desktop manager in this class. We don't need one. And in my opinion, any secure Linux system, you know, that's a server-based Linux system, you don't need a desktop environment. Um, some people disagree with me on that. And they say, you know, it's really helpful to have a desktop environment. Brian, it's the year 2020. We should have a desktop on everything. But, you know, uh, Microsoft Windows doesn't even do a desktop environment anymore on everything. I mean, look at Windows... Uh, 2016 core, right? Uh, by default, if you deploy a Windows server, Microsoft is now recommending core for a lot of things, right? If you're running Active Directory or, um, you know, if you're running, you know, DNS servers or, you know, whatever from Microsoft or even IIS, uh, you don't need to have the desktop environment. They strip it away. And that's what core uh, edition is of 2016 server. And I'm sure the future versions will work the same way. Uh, it kind of kind of eased in starting in 2012. 
Well, Linux has always been a desktop free operating system, right? It's something that we have to add on. But here's the thing about GNOME. If you use the package manager like Yum to install GNOME, it installs almost a thousand packages that are used to support GNOME. So if you tried to install it on that machine that we stood up in Google, right? Which is a very bare bones CentOS system, right? It doesn't really have, you know, it comes to us pre sort of hardened, right? And I think Google smartly when they create the images that they use, they, they, they pared them down to next to nothing because they know that they're always going to be exposed to the internet, right? So they just assume that they have to be hardened. So that's kind of, kind of nice, but it does make it kind of hard to do our labs, right? Because if we want to play around with a system that isn't hardened and see all the stuff that's it's vulnerable to, it does make it more difficult, which we're going to see next week. Um, but in any event, that's a lot of packages. And you'll see that if you try to install the GNOME desktop manager on uh on your systems if you wanted to try that gnome isn't the only culprit right there are a lot of packages that install a lot of dependencies so it's definitely something to be aware of we saw in this class how we can um how we can see dependencies on services and there's also commands and it's described in your textbook to look at the dependencies on packages so you can look at a package say okay i know i've got apache installed what are the dependencies what packages did Apache have to install, right? So for example, if you install uh, PHP, it'll have Apache as a dependency, right? Um, but you don't really necessarily have to have Apache with PHP, right? Some people install PHP just as a scripting language without even using a web server, right? So theoretically you could do something like that. So you don't always have to have those dependencies and it's, it's good to try to you know, figure out what dependencies you need and which ones you don't. So as far as service management goes, we've uh, actually talked about service management already in this class. Um, basically, with service management, we're talking about starting services, ensuring that the services start up correctly, that they don't error, right? We saw how to do that in the previous lab, right? We looked at the journal and we tried to start a service. We looked at the log files, essentially, right? Um, and then manually starting and stopping services when we need to, right? So we, we want to make sure we're familiar with all of that manual service management and, you know, setting up services so they automatically start up and, and all that other stuff that we talked about. Now, I also have already in this course talked about different ways to manage services. Uh, you know, we, we initially talked about System 5 in it, right? Uh, your book talks a lot about System 5 in it. Almost every chapter it comes up uh, so far. And uh, the first thing we talk about are run levels, right? Which is a way of categorizing the functionality and determining which mode a system will operate which and which services are going to be available, right? So you can use different run levels for different purposes. For example, one, rev one level is when you're shutting a machine down. It's basically taking down all the services. You might have another one for when it's multi-user mode and so forth. So the, uh, uh, the init process is the master process that starts all of the services in every Linux distro you always start within it right so in it is always that parent of everything right we talked about that already right if you think back um, and then you have the Linux standard base which specifically calls for seven run levels right um, we talked about those seven run levels I'll show you what they are again here in just a second and then you have the um, the shell which you log into and you can you know use the system with the shell that's we log into the shell uh, for our, our labs right for our practical assignments these are the run levels you can see here, right? Zero through six. So there are seven run levels altogether. We've talked about these before. Um, run level zero is shut down. Run level one is single user mode. Then you have multi mode or multi user mode with no networking, multi user mode with networking, four, which is not used, although you could use it if you wanted to. You can customize one. And then you have multi user node with networking and a graphical user interface. And then reboot is six, right? And you can generally set the default run level on your Linux system, right? So you can decide that, uh, you know, you want the default to be run level three because you don't need a graphical user interface. Um, although that said, if you don't need it, then it's best to get rid of it, right? That's part of the hardening process. We're going to want to make sure we get rid of um, those things that we don't require, right? That, that aren't needed because it's still a vulnerability if it's on there, even if we have it turned off and we're not using it, right? It's There's still that attack surface. Um, but in any event, these are the different run levels we have to work with, right? Uh, you can set the default, right? You wouldn't want to set the default to run level six, right? Because otherwise, every single time your machine starts, it's going to reboot itself, right? Um, unless you want to play a mean joke on somebody that, that you know, right? Um, but these are the run levels, right? And these are the same on almost every Linux system in the world. Uh, you know, they pretty much work the same way. It's, it's pretty well standardized.
Now, there are some challenges with System 5 in it. I've talked about these a little bit before, but again, it's rehashed in this unit. Um, and it is serial in nature, which means that when it's doing that process of starting and stopping services, it has to do one at a time, right? So if there are 19 services to be started and 15 services to be stopped when going from one level to one, one level to another, it has to do each one at a time, right? Even though it may be able to start five at a time, right? It doesn't do that, right? So it's, so it's serial. Every step has to be executed one at a time. Um, initialization scripts don't directly support dependencies. Um, so in other words, you have to know the dependencies of services when you do the configurations and set up those startup scripts, which I actually showed you in one of the labs, right? I showed you what that looks like in one of my demonstrations. And then you have to make sure you have one service before another name with sim links in the run level directories, right? So I showed you how those, um, uh, you know, you have the run level directories, the RC.1, RC.4, RC.5, whatever. And if you go into RC.5, for example, you would have a symbolic link to either a stop or a kill file, right? A stop um, or a start or a kill file, right? S files are start, K files are kill, and they're numbered with an integer. So it's like S1 to start the first service, S2 to start the second service, S3, S4, S5, right? And it goes in that order. Um, you have to make sure you get that right, right? And let's say you go one, two, three, four, five, but then you discover that you need something between four and five, you know, you'd have to sort of, you know, move things around and rename things. Luckily, there's utilities that'll do that for you, right? So there's a suite of tools and utilities you can use to manage in it. That's one of the things a lot of people didn't like about in it is that while it was elegantly simple and easy to understand, uh, you need a lot of utilities around it to work with it, right? And, and you'd have this big suite of utilities and that was one of the things they were trying to get rid of, right? So, there are two alternatives to System 5, two major alternatives. One is Upstart, which is mostly used in the Debian derivatives, right? So the Debian distros typically use Upstart. Um, until 2015, right? I'm recording this video in 2020, so I think you'd be hard-pressed to find uh, systems that are still using Upstart, right? I think almost everyone has transitioned to System D, which we learned about already. Um, but basically, Upstart is... is, is one option it still uses in it as the master process um i i kind of think of upstart as just another suite of utilities for init right um but the other option the other option is system d uh again we've used system d already in this class because system d is the default for red hat it was actually developed by red hat right so it makes sense that we have it in centos as the default and again it's in almost every other distro at this point um you know ubuntu moved to it in 2015 i think i showed you a chart uh, as of 2020, all the distros that are using just in it and all the distros that are now using system D, uh, pretty much everyone's transitioning to system D unless it's a really watered down system, you know, uh, gen two, your book talks about, uh, gen two Linux and, and that one I believe still uses in it. There's a few other ones that use in it, uh, you know, especially things like that you might install on a raspberry Pi or a beagle bone or something like that. Probably you're going to use in it because it's a much smaller footprint than system D. And again, it's a very elegant way to manage services when, uh, you know, you have a relatively simple system. So the first process starts on a system um, is system D rather than init, right? So this is essentially a replacement for init as opposed to another set of tools on top of init. Um, and it provides a foundation for management of the entire system. So it's, it's everything, right? It's a whole suite that basically replaces in it and it includes all these other, you know, all the other tools that we need to operate and run a system. It pretty much does everything, right? It has uh, journal D, which uh, does our logging, right? We, we learned about that already. It has a, uh, it has a wrapper built into it, right? So you don't need this other X in it D, which we use in init based systems. It's all handled by system D, um, all kind of wrapped up in that one service. So it does provide better security. It has uh, um, it's easier to configure. It's easier to understand. Uh, you don't have to do any scripting and configuration files, uh, you know, except for, you know, when you saw that we set up a config file, uh, you know, it's, it, it, so in other words, in, in it, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you want to create your own service using in it, you have to write your own, uh, file, but instead of a config file, it is a config file, but you actually have to put shell scripts in, inside that config file and it can get a little bit dicey when you're when you're doing that right if you're not sure exactly what you're doing whereas with system d 
it's very rare that you have to write those shell scripts in a config file, right? Pretty much everything we need was wrapped up in that config file. And you saw that when we did the lab where we worked with system D, right? We created our own service. We created our own file. When I used to teach this course a long time ago and we used in it, not a long time ago, you know, probably three, four years ago, we were still teaching this class using in it. Um, system D wasn't really the cat's pajamas yet, right? Um, and we were using uh, a Debian distro and, you know, teaching students how to create those shell scripts to create those init files this, with the sim links, right? It was a little bit more kludgy, right? It made the labs a little bit harder, but um, so certainly having that simplification and not having to do scripting is good. Um, generally, if, you, you know, the less scripting you have to do, the better it is from a security perspective. I love scripting. Scripting's a lot of fun. I love solving problems with scripts. I do it in both Windows and Linux, right? PowerShell on Windows is pretty fun. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. Um, but PowerShell is a great example. PowerShell, you can do a lot of dangerous stuff with PowerShell as well. And people that know PowerShell really well can do some interesting things with Windows. And Linux is no different with the uh, with Bash, right? There's a lot of stuff you can do with Bash shell scripts. Um, there's some pretty crazy examples out there. There was, uh, I was gonna use one in this class. Um, somebody wrote a Bash shell script that basically uses a shell script to run a, as a web server. Instead, we use Python to do that, right? Although Python is also a scripting language. Um, but in any event, we don't have to script. Uh, it's all config files, so certainly better in, in that respect as well. So how do we harden services? Uh, first thing we can think about is forcing the system to run with a limited set of permissions. So in other words, you know, I've talked about this before, that everything in Linux is a file, right? And everything comes down to the permissions that these files have. So if you, you can create user accounts that have only the exact permissions that you know that a service requires. No more and no less, right? So that's one way to handle security and harden a service is instead of having it run as root or under the root privileges or, you know, some other user with, you know, a, a vast array of privileges, you can use specific accounts to run services that you configure that account with the exact permissions. And you can even use ACLs, right? We talked about ACLs briefly last week. So you can use ACLs to further refine and, and provide more granular permissions on what exactly that service is allowed to do. So certainly one of the most powerful techniques I think we have in our toolbox as far as hardening services in Linux is setting the user accounts in which they run. We can limit network communication from remote hosts. So this could be a combination of things like firewalls, but also take a look at the config files for services. Um, Apache and MySQL come to mind, right? Uh, if you install MySQL or MariaDB, which is almost the same thing, you'll see a config file that when it's installed by default, it's only going to bind to the local loopback, meaning that when it starts up, it only binds to the local machine. It's not going to bind to a public or to an IP address that's bound, you know, to the network. So that means no one can communicate with it from outside the machine. So IP tables kind of manages that, right? In other words, it's going to bind to 127.0.0.1. And if you try to connect to it on the real IP address of the machine, IP tables isn't going to know how to route it because that particular service didn't bind to that IP address. It bound to the 127. It's not routable, right, uh, from the uh, the network. So it's simply, you know, from the perspective of somebody outside that computer, it's simply not there, the service, right? So that's definitely a good way to do this. And you can check a lot of services have config files that will allow you to do that if it's appropriate, right? Now you might be saying, Brian, you know, something like MySQL or MariaDB or Oracle or what have you, aren't those databases that people are going to need to get access to, right? And, you know, my answer to that is yes, sometimes, but in many cases, the application that's using MariaDB or MySQL could be on the same system and it simply isn't necessary for it to bind to a to a to an IP address outside the system because everything all the traffic is actually happening internal anyway, right? Um, you know, look at uh, um, PHP, right? If you write a web application in PHP that uses MySQL, which is really common, right? It's probably one of the most common uses of MySQL is you know it's paired with PHP or Perl or Python or something like that. And Apache is calling those scripts or calling the executables to run those scripts, files or those compile on demand scripts. And they're querying the database all within the same machine. So even though users are accessing those databases externally, they're doing it abstracted through these scripting languages. So 
I, I would argue in many cases you really don't need the bind to anything other than the local loopback, and it's certainly something important to think about, right? It's going to reduce that attack service. You can restrict the interfaces on which a service listens, um, which is kind of related to the previous point, right? Um, you can protect your databases. Uh, you can use access control lists, as I talked about before, when you're sending permissions. Again, you know, whatever user account the service is running as, you can use ACLs. You can use ACLs to protect, you know, files that you know need to be protected from, uh, you know, that, that you have to have those files, but you can protect it with ACLs. Um, you know, you can have authentication enabled for all of these services. Uh, make sure you use authentication that is encrypted. Your book talks a little bit about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not too crazy about the discussion in your book about Base64. They talk about that as an encryption algorithm, and it's not. Base64, for all intents and purposes, is really a plain text, right? You're just encoding plain text using Base64, but to convert that back to plain text, there's no, there's no key, right? There's no certificate. There's no... Um, you know, it's not really encryption, right? Although, the, and the book makes the case that, well, it's not really encryption, but somebody might not recognize it, right, as plain text. They'd have to know, admit that it's Base64, but I think most attackers can recognize Base64 when they see it. I know I can, and I'm not an attacker for the most part, right? Um, so the, the right way to manage user accounts, of course, is to use a hash, uh, or use some kind of digest authentication, right? So which is really what hashes do for us. In other words, we're storing the hash, right? We actually learned about that already because we learned about the password file, right? Which stores a hash. Um, now, most of the services that we install today uh, can support um, encrypted login, right? Like I was just talking about MariaDB and MySQL, right? And Oracle, um, and even Microsoft SQL Server, which, by the way, runs on Linux, right? I know people are like, wait a minute, why are you talking about Microsoft SQL Server in a Linux class? Well, Microsoft SQL Server 2017 actually runs natively on Linux now, right? Uh, more and more things do. So, and it actually runs pretty well on Linux. But um, all of those support encrypted login, right? They all support, uh, you know, um, not only encrypted login, but encrypting all the traffic to and from the service Generally, if we can avoid plain text, it's better to do that. It certainly makes the job of somebody who's attacking a system much harder if everything is encrypted, right? Um, you know, you have to have a valid certificate. You know, it's um, you can't just work with plain text. You know, it's it's kind of easy to reverse engineer something when it's all plain text. You can tell net to a specific port, and you can try to work with that service on a on a you know on a port to which you tell net. We actually did that in this class already, right? Remember, think back to the lab where I had you, I should call it a practical assignment, where I asked you to connect to a telnet on port 80 to a web server, to that Python web server, right? And then you kind of pass the commands, uh, you know, manually from telnet as if you were a web browser, right? If you tried to do that with Python listening on encrypted port, right, using HTTPS, it's a lot harder to do that, right? So it's much more difficult to kind of poke and prod at a system when it's using encryption because there's a whole nother set of steps that you have to take in order to do that. So it's much more difficult. So again, encryption, uh, if it's available for a service, we want to enable it, we want to configure it, uh, you know, to whatever degree is appropriate. We want to make sure that we're not storing and exchanging passwords in plain text and not base 64 either, in my opinion. Uh, if you're using base 64, you might as well be using plain text. So again, lots of things we can do to harden our services on our systems. We're going to talk a little bit more about these vulnerabilities uh, in the next unit. We talk about application vulnerabilities, so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So we talked about access controls already, right? It, you know, the default with Linux is discretionary access control, right? Um, this is where access is modified by users. So you create a file and then you decide what access you're going to allow to that file. By default, if you create a file, you have full access to that file um, and you can decide who to delegate control to. You can transfer it to somebody else. You can add groups to it. You can do whatever you want, right? That's discretionary access control. And it's somewhat secure, but it's not considered by most experts to be a, a very high degree of, of, of control and security, right? So the next best option is mandatory access controls, which take away some of that discretion from the user, right? So it removes that discretion and kind of centralizes that control. And there's really two options for mandatory access controls.
The first is Security Enhanced Linux, or SC Linux, and this is what we've been playing with on our, on our systems, on our CentOS systems. So we've already done some labs with this, right? This week is a lot of kind of rehashing some of the things we already learned about and just discussing, you know, how we used it, right? But as I mentioned before, it was developed by the NSA, the National Security Agency. Uh, Red Hat um, also did a lot of development in SC Linux, and of course, it's the default with most Red Hat distros. That's not to say that you couldn't use it on the distros, right? So you could take SC Linux, install that package on a Debian system, and it'll work just fine, right? But it provides a lockdown on file system files, uh, implements labels to provide more granularity permissions on files. Um, you can set permissions to either permissive or enforcing mode, which we saw. So in enforcing mode, the kernel uh, modules prevent unauthorized access to certain things and to, for certain policies, whereas with uh, permissive mode, it allows it, but it complains, right? It logs that somebody tried to do something with the file, but it still lets you do that. And it's great for troubleshooting, right? And then we'll go back to enforcing once we kind of know how those permissions are going to affect something. So users cannot make changes to permissions when using SE Linux. It's outside the user space, right? This is actually in the kernel. So instead of the user having discretion, the kernel is enforcing, uh, you know, these these restrictions. It's a module that's built, you know, baked into the kernel. It's compiled into the kernel. Um, so SE Linux, of course is a lot better than discretionary access control. So if a process doesn't have the right content, it won't be able to bind to the port, for example. Um, now remember, SC Linux is not just file permissions, it's uh, policies, right? So, uh, you know, SC Linux is a series of policies and you can build your own policies and plug them into SC Linux if you wanted to, right? Not unlike Microsoft Windows. So I, I, would, I think, you know, if you've learned about Microsoft Windows, I think an analog to this in Microsoft Windows would be Active Directory's um, uh, group policies, right? So group policies function very similar to SC Linux, but there's a lot of group policies in the Windows world because, you know, we're dealing with a lot of applications that are user facing in the Windows world, right? Um, they can have a lot of granular configurations, whereas with Linux, they're all server based. Um, you know, mostly server-based, right? We don't have a lot of user-facing applications in Linux. Uh, it's mostly server-based, so not as many controls are required, right? We don't need as much stuff, uh, as many policies. So that's a little bit about SE Linux. The other option is AppArmor, which is uh, um, was originally developed for an older distribution of, of Linux. Not that old, right? But um, but it's uh, Ubuntu, right? It's the default in Ubuntu and, and the various derivatives I would say Debian, right? I, I, they always say Ubuntu on, on in our textbook, but to me, Debian's kind of the master of Ubuntu, right? Ubuntu is a derivative of, of Debian, but um, so anyway, Ubuntu basically uses AppArmor, right? Um, it's very similar to SE Linux, uh, except um, it, it has an enforce and complain mode instead of enforce and permissive mode, um, but you know, same basic idea, right? It just was developed by a different group um, different sets of policies, right? There's definitely a, you know, the policies that you have in App Armor are slightly different, but you know, if you look at App Armor, the policies that are available to you for things like Apache and and VSFTP or whatever FTP server is the default in Ubuntu, um, and you know, the database servers and things like that, you'll find similar options in App Armor, right? So it's really kind of an equivalent option. But either way, if we're hardening a system for hardening services. Uh, it is a must to have either App Armor or SC Linux running and in enforcing mode if we're if we're going to be hardening a system, right? There's a lot of tools in there that we can use to harden our systems. Our book talks about server versus desktop, right? And I've been saying this over and over again that you know for the most part, you know if we're if we're building a Linux systems, they're typically servers, right? I, I don't really know of too many desktop Linux systems out there in in the, the you know business world, right? Uh, which is the vast majority of you know usage of Linux systems, right? Is organizations and business, right? Not a lot of us sit at home with a Linux system. Although arguably you would say that your phone is probably Linux, right? Under the hood, um, you know BSD if it's a Mac, right? Um, so to and to that extent, I suppose um, you know, but that's not Linux, right? And this class is mostly about Linux. Uh, which is typically a server operating system. So with a server, you have a limited set of services that are exposed to the outside world 
only services should be primarily service the server is there to provide, right? So we're not going to put services on there that are things that we're not actually providing with that server. Administrative services uh, should exist on separate interface and not be exposed. And we may have multiple network interfaces on servers typically, right? Uh, a lot of times they're connected to multiple networks, so there's redundancy and things like that. Um, for desktops, on the other hand, uh, there's usually a lot more packages installed. There are different services that are installed. Uh, they may use NFS as a client to access files on the network, right? Uh, similar to how you would do with SMB in the Microsoft world. And you may have other services associated with remote access, right? So you can access the desktop remotely, for example, like VNC or something like that. Um, but again, I, I think in the Linux world, I, I spend a lot less time talking about the desktop and talking about hardening a desktop. You know, I think I feel like that should be reserved for sort of a Windows based, uh, you know, security class, because that's really the the realm of desktops is the is sort of the Windows and the Mac uh, world or BSD. Right. If you're on Mac, um, we really don't see a lot of Linux systems running as a desktop. Uh, you know, it's just not common. So your book talks about development tools. Our last topic, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit. And I, I feel like it's uh, kind of borrowing trouble, <laughs> you know, um, because what, what they're really talking about here is in the old days when you had all these different architectures, right? So you had uh, Spark and you had IBM processors and ARM and, you know, maybe you have Adreno and whatever and for modern platforms. Linux runs on all this stuff, right? Unix, really, I should say, Unix ran on almost everything back in the old days, you know, the 70s, the 80s, you know, all these different platforms, all these different architectures supported Unix. And if you were an attacker, um, you could write, you know, some tool that you need that you're going to use to attack a system. You would write it in C or C++, probably C, right? Because that runs on almost anything. And as long as there's a compiler on the system, you can compile your tool, right? And the idea was that if you had an executable binary, you can't just, you couldn't just copy an executable binary onto any system and run it, right? It didn't work. You'd have to compile it from source so that you knew that it would work on that architecture. The compiler would know how to compile it for that particular architecture that, you know, for whatever you're sitting on. So you could easily thwart attackers by simply not having compilers, right? Not having those development tools. Um, available to attackers so they they couldn't run them if they weren't there right now the thing is today almost every system uh out there right the predominant system out there is intel based architecture which means that you can build a, a binary executable for intel architecture 64-bit for example and you could copy it to you know there's a 90 percent chance that if you copy it to any linux system you're connected to it's going to run right um, because it, it, we really don't have that diversity in architecture anymore, right? It's, uh, yeah, sure, you have some power PC out there, you know, and so forth, but, and Adreno processors, right? Um, but for the most part, you know, most of our servers and most of our corporate data centers are running on Intel architecture, uh, and that's the reality that we live in. Uh, even Mac has moved to Intel architecture. Um, so it, the... The other thing that the book talks about is this idea of command injection attack, right? So uh, an attacker could get in through a web server or a web application uh, and, and start executing commands through a web application if they're able to inject those commands. We're actually going to try this in our lab. We're going to play around with these injection attacks. Um, so looking for an attack surface that would allow us to do these injection attacks. There's lots of different types of injection attacks. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about that and how those work. Um, but in, from my perspective, development tools are not really an enabler of those injection attacks, right? Because again, most, most um, now I shouldn't say that, you know, uh, you know, scripting languages, right? And I think actually your book does talk about scripting languages um, and how they can be used to attack systems, right? Uh, you know, PHP, Python, Perl, Ruby, whatever, right? Um, you know, because if you can get past the web server and start executing commands and for example in php you know php is a great example there are methods available in php to do just about anything on the system right you can um you know you can inject a command in php to figure out exactly what version of the linux kernel somebody has and what distro they're on which then reveals a lot of information that you can use um you can 
you can also, uh, you know, with PHP, you can write files, you can read files, you can traverse directories. And, you know, if somebody left Apache running with an account that has access to do a lot of that stuff, um, you know, if you can inject those commands. And likewise, you can inject into SQL all kinds of interesting things. You know, there's a way to inject commands into MySQL that can reveal information about the operating system. Um, so again, we'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff, though, I think when we talk uh, next week about application security in the next uh, it or, you know, the next unit of this course. So protecting against these development tools, uh, most Linux systems have package management systems uh, where tools can be easily installed from a package repository. So basically, if an attacker doesn't have the tool that they need and they know what distribution you're on, they know that, for example, that yum is going to work, that if they can somehow inject the yum command that installs netcat, for example, which is a kind of a cool hacking tool. You can do a lot of interesting things with Netcat. Maybe we'll play around with that in this class in one of the future units. Um, but, you know, again, it's another attack surface, right? So, you know, is it a good idea to lock down that kind of stuff or can we lock down that sort of thing? So the more packages you have installed, the more risk you assume, right? And we've talked about that already. All right, now I already talked about scripting languages. So that's it. So this week, it's a relatively short week for the lecture. Uh, we are not going to have a practical assignment this week. We're going to have kind of a bye week this week, so a nice break from the practical assignments. And I'll see you next week where we start talking about application security in Linux.